If you want to look into the very hearts of the men who founded, the majority of the men who founded our country, a good place for you to go would be the proclamations issued by the Continental Congress during the turbulent years of the Revolutionary War. They issued 15 such proclamations from 1775 to 1783. We've been looking at these tremendous organic utterances issued to the entire nation. And they are rich indeed and enable us to zero in on the core key critical concept that the founders believed was the propulsion system for our civilization. Let's turn to one that was issued by the Congress in March of 1780. It having pleased the righteous governor of the world for the punishment of our manifold offenses to permit the sword of war still to harass our country, it becomes us to endeavor by humbling ourselves before him and turning from every evil way to avert his anger and obtain his favor and blessing. Notice what the founder said there. Our political leaders, let alone our rank and file citizens, if we hope to have God's favor and not be punished for our sins, especially on a national level, then we have got to look to Him and humble ourselves before Him. Do you not get the idea that a lot of our politicians are prideful? Whenever the citizens rise up and say, wait a minute, we want that done, and they, they hold one of their meetings and they say, well, you know, who are you? We're going to do what we want to do. And in a sense, Congress has pretty much been doing what it wants to do for a number of years, separated and seemingly unconcerned about their constituents. The founders said, we had better humble ourselves before God and quit defiantly thinking we're the ones that run this nation and we're the ones that decide how things ought to go. We'd better turn to Him to avert His wrath, to manifest humility before Him. There is a key quintessential ingredient for bringing our nation back to where it needs to be. Notice what else the founders said in this proclamation. That Wednesday... They recommend, therefore, to the several states that Wednesday, the 26th day of April next, be set apart and observed as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, that we may with one heart and one voice implore the Sovereign Lord of heaven and earth to remember mercy in His judgments, to make us sincerely penitent for our transgressions, and prepare us for deliverance, and to remove the evils with which He hath been pleased to visit us, to banish vice and irreligion from among us. You know, we've turned a lot of our young people in our universities over to irreligious instructors. We need to banish vice and irreligion from among us and establish virtue and piety, that is Christian morality, by His divine grace. To bless all public councils throughout the United States, giving them wisdom, firmness, unanimity, directing them to the best measures for the public good, to bless the magistrates and people of every rank and animate and unite the hearts of all to promote the interest of their country, not self-interest. To bless the public defense, inspiring all commanders and soldiers with magnanimity and perseverance and giving vigor and success to the military operations by sea and land. To bless the illustrious sovereign and the nation in alliance with these states, that is France, and all who interest themselves in the support of our rights and liberties to make that alliance of perpetual extensive usefulness to those immediately concerned and mankind in general. That's prophetic. America has blessed uh, the rest of the world more than perhaps any other civilization in human history. To grant fruitful seasons, to bless our industry, trade, and manufactures, to bless all schools and seminaries of learning, and every means of instruction and education, so necessary, you see, to uh, such a nation as ours, to cause wars to cease, and to establish peace among the nations. And it is further recommended that servile labor and recreation be forbidden on said day. Isn't that interesting that the founders believed that by forbidding servile labor, people going to work on that day, they, they felt they had a right to tell people, you know, this is so important. 
to praise God and to ask God for help, you need to not work on that day. So we're making it a national requirement that you stay home and offer your concern to God about our predicament. Let's move to yet another proclamation. This one now in 1780, uh, October, toward the end of the year. Whereas it hath pleased Almighty God, the Father of all mercies, amid the vicissitudes and calamities of war, to bestow blessings on the people of these states, which call for their devout and thankful acknowledgments. More especially in the late remarkable interposition of His watchful providence in rescuing the person of our Commander-in-Chief and the army from imminent dangers at the moment when treason was ripened for execution. You know what they're talking about. You've heard about Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold was the commandant of West Point, and he conspired with the British to turn his command to forfeit West Point to the British. He was a traitor. And yet by an unusual, according to the founders, a very unusual uh, chain of circumstances which they attributed to the providence of God. The plot was uncovered, it was exposed on September 23rd, 1780, and consequently uh, they were able to prevent this, what, what would have been a great blow to the American army. And here are the founders of our country telling us that we need to thank God for that providential intervention on our behalf as a nation. They believe that God was blessing us by the foiling of that plot. Absolutely astounding. Notice then how this continues. They beg God above all to continue to us the enjoyment of the gospel of peace in allusion to the gospel. It's therefore recommended to the several states to set apart Thursday, the seventh day of December next, to be observed as a day of public thanksgiving and prayer that all people may assemble on that day to celebrate the praises of our divine benefactor, to confess our unworthiness of the least of his favors, and to offer our fervent supplications to the God of all grace, that it may please him to pardon our heinous transgressions, and notice, incline our hearts for the future to keep all his laws. How many of our politicians are urging their constituents to keep the laws of God? Notice how they conclude this uh, proclamation. To cherish all schools and seminaries of education and to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread over all the earth. Folks, here are the founders of our country urging all Americans to beg God, to plead with God, to ask God to spread Christianity over the entire planet. How many Americans perceive that that is even the responsibility of politicians? Who, who conceives of promo the promotion of Christianity as a part of a politician's responsibilities as a public official? I would suggest to you perhaps universally in our nation. That's not what people think. But it's what the founders said. And we would do well to give it heed. Moving to the next year, March 18th, 1781, they issued yet another proclamation. Look carefully at this one. At all times, it is our duty to acknowledge the overruling providence of the great governor of the universe and devoutly to implore his divine favor and protection. But in the hour of calamity and impending danger, when by fire and the sword, by the savages of the wilderness, by our own domestics, a vindictive enemy pursues a war of rapine and devastation with unrelenting fury, we are peculiarly excited with true penitence of heart to prostrate ourselves before our great Creator and fervently to supplicate His gracious interposition for our deliverance. Do you remember when 911 occurred? In just a matter of minutes, some 3,000 Americans lost their lives due to those aircraft flying into those Twin Towers. Do you know for about five minutes, a lot of Americans got rather religious. In fact, I remember a number of our Congress people came out on the steps of the Capitol and sang, God bless America. I was surprised that the, the steps there didn't fracture and fall apart and the whole thing collapsed. 
People put signs in their, in their yards, God bless America. For a moment there, we got a, a combination of patriotism and religion. But it didn't last long. It evaporated quickly. But do you not see that the founders are saying, when we face public distress as a nation, we have got to turn to God. He is the source of our deliverance. And without Him, we can expect nothing but heartache and problems and trouble. We would do well to listen to the founders because they made this point so clear and they made it so frequently. It is surely the truth. Consequently, the founders continued, the United States in Congress assembled, therefore do earnestly recommend that Thursday, the third day of May next, may be observed as a day of humiliation, fasting, and prayer that we may with united hearts confess and bewail our manifold sins and transgressions, and by sincere repentance and amendment of life, appease His righteous displeasure, and through the merits of our blessed Savior, obtain pardon and forgiveness. Now, we've made this point a number of times. We've become so politically correct. We have become so enamored with what we call diversity, where we want to embrace and accept all religious perspectives. Do you know the founders would not agree with that? Oh, they would, they would promote tolerance. They would say, if you want to come to our country and you hold a non-Christian viewpoint, uh, you're welcome here. In fact, you won't be persecuted here like you will in most other countries because we are a Christian-oriented people. However, uh, your, view, your views are not going to be allowed to move into the, the mainstream. We're not, we're not going to refurbish our schools in order not to offend you. We're not going to alter our institutions in order to please you. You may come here and live peaceably and flourish with the rest of us as long as your religion doesn't promote immorality or harm to other Americans. But we as a republic have established this grand republic on the idea that there's one God. He's the God of the Bible. And Jesus Christ is His Son. Christian, the Christian religion, therefore, is the one true religion. And therefore, we promote and encourage Christianity throughout all of our institutions and our culture. And we see this as the key to both the establishment of this republic and its perpetuation and future success. Now, that was the view of the founders. And to the extent that we move away from that fundamental understanding, to that extent, we can expect the demise of our civilization. Finally, the founders uh, say, as we skip over a little bit of this, notice what they say toward the end, that it may please him to bless all schools and seminaries of learning and to grant that truth, justice, and benevolence and pure and undefiled religion may universally prevail. True or pure and undefiled religion is a direct quotation of James chapter 1 and verse 27. Let's hurry along and look at yet another one issued the same year, October 28, 1781. Whereas it hath pleased Almighty God, the Father of mercies, remarkably to assist and support the United States of America in their important struggle for liberty, against the long-continued efforts of a powerful nation, it is the duty of all ranks to observe and thankfully acknowledge the interpositions of His providence in their behalf. Notice how often they refer to God being very directly active in providentially assisting in our nation's establishment. Through the whole of the contest, from its first rise to this time, the influence of divine providence may be clearly perceived in many signal instances of which we mention but a few. Now notice, here are the founders, and they are going to give us a listing of indicators of God's providence in the establishment of our nation. They believe that every step of the way, there was instance after instance, occasion after occasion, circumstance after circumstance, where God could be perceived in His great non-miraculous, but nevertheless, a providential interaction in our society and in our country. They believed His influence was involved. So much so that they're able to enumerate these. Okay, we saw God working here. We saw God acting here. Look at some of these uh, which they list for us. In revealing the counsel of our enemies. We saw one of those in the last proclamation. When the discoveries were seasonable and important and the means seemingly inadequate or fortuitous. Uh, in preserving and even improving the union of the several states. 
on the breach of which our enemies place their greatest dependence. The British hoped to create dissension and disunity among the states and we would fall apart, but we had unity. The founder said, boy, God was behind that. In increasing the number and adding to the zeal and attachment of the friends of liberty, like France and other allies, in granting remarkable deliverances, blessing us with the most signal success when affairs seem to have the most discouraging appearance, in raising up for us a powerful and generous ally and one of the first of the European powers, in confounding the counsels of our enemies, suffering them to pursue such measures as have most directly contributed to frustrate their own desires and expectations. You know, all of these are things that were occurring and they were watching them occur and they attributed it to God. Notice as we move down, and as we cannot help leading the good people of these states to a retrospect on the events which have taken place since the beginning of the war, so we recommend in a particular manner to their observation the goodness of God in the year now drawing to a close. And as you move down to the end of that paragraph, they say, and in which, after the success of our allies by sea, a general of the first rank with his whole army has been captured by the allied forces under the direction of our commander-in-chief. They're referring to the unbelievable capture, conquering of uh, Lord Cornwallis. British Major General who surrendered on October 19, 1781 to French and American forces. An unbelievable defeat for the British and a great boon to the advancement of the American cause. Notice then as we come down toward the close of this uh, proclamation, they once again urge Americans to supplicate God, the God of all grace, that it may please Him to pardon our offenses and incline our hearts for the future to keep all his laws. And then notice how they conclude this proclamation, to cause the knowledge of God to cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. That is a direct allusion uh, to the book of Habakkuk. The founders wanted Christianity to cover the planet like water covers the oceans. What a tremendous perspective that seems to have been all but lost in our political institutions today. Let's look at yet another proclamation. This one delivered in 1782, the first of two that year in March. The goodness of the supreme being to all his rational creatures demands their acknowledgments of gratitude and love. His absolute government of the world dictates that it is the interest of every nation and people ardently to supplicate his favor and implore his protection. Now notice their assessment of England. When the lust of dominion or lawless ambition excites arbitrary power to invade the rights or endeavor to wrest from a people their sacred and invaluable privileges and compels them in defense of the same to encounter all the horrors and calamities of a bloody and vindictive war, then is that people loudly called upon to fly unto that God for protection who hears the cries of the distressed and will not turn a deaf ear to the supplication of the oppressed. Great Britain hitherto left to infatuated counsels and to pursue measures repugnant to her own interest and distressing to this country still persists in the design of subjugating these United States, which will compel us into another active and perhaps bloody campaign. The United States, therefore, in Congress assembled, taking into consideration our present situation, our manifold transgressions, of the holy laws of our God and His past acts of kindness and goodness toward us, which we ought to record with the liveliest gratitude. Think it their indispensable duty to call upon the several states to set apart the last Thursday in April next as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, that our joint supplications may then ascend to the throne of the ruler of the universe, beseeching Him to diffuse a spirit of universal reformation among all ranks and degrees of our citizens and now notice this very important point, and make us a holy that we be a happy people. If you were to take a poll of the entire American population today, all 300 million plus, and say, what will make you happy? What is the key to happiness? Tell me what we could give you that would make you happy. Do you know the answers to that would be widespread and varied? But the Bible teaches, 
And the founders understood that the Bible teaches that in order to be happy, citizens must first be holy. That is, they must embrace the Christian religion and dedicate themselves to live according to the will of the God of the universe. They must have attachment to the Christian religion. And there is the key. There is the source of human happiness. Who believes that today? So you see, when people, including our politicians and others, want to strip Christianity out of our political system, when our educational system wants to strip Christianity out of our public schools, when our judges say, you can't bring a Bible into the jury room for deliberate, when our judges and our courts and our uh, law enforcement system want to strip the Bible, strip Christianity out of our legal system, folks, according to the founders, we're committing national suicide. We are literally with our own hands plucking down our own house and bringing about our own destruction. That's what the founders believed on the matter. Look how they bring this uh, particular proclamation to a close. Once again, at the very end, may the religion of our divine Redeemer, with all its benign influences, cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I mentioned that that is a direct allusion to Habakkuk chapter 2. It's also mentioned over in Isaiah. Once again, here's the founders calling upon all Americans to turn to God and to ask Him, please God, please allow Christianity. Notice the religion of our divine Redeemer. That's not Muhammad. That's not the Dalai Lama. That's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who came to this planet 2,000 years ago. Deity who inhabited flesh, came to the planet, atoned for human sin, and then returned to God and seated at His right hand, rules over His kingdom. And the founder said, May God help us and may He do everything possible to allow that religion, the religion of Christ, to spread all over the world to blanket our planet. Later that year, October 11th, the founders issued yet another proclamation, it being the indispensable duty of all nations, not only to offer up their supplications to Almighty God, the giver of all good, for His gracious assistance in a time of distress, but also in a solemn and public manner. Notice that religious expression is to be public, not private only but in a public manner to give Him praise for His goodness in general and especially for great and signal interpositions of His providence in their behalf. Therefore, the United States and Congress assemble, taking into their consideration the many instances of divine goodness to these states in the course of the important conflict in which they have been so long engaged. The present happy and promising state of public affairs, the war was winding down, and the events of the war in the course of the year now drawing to a close particularly the harmony of the public councils, which is so necessary to the success of the public cause. Notice, we as a nation are more fragmented than we've ever been. The founders said we've got to be united on the key issues. Notice then how they uh, comment toward the end, to testify their gratitude to God for His goodness by a cheerful obedience to His laws. No politician can do better than to encourage citizens to obey God and by proclaiming, promoting, each in his station and by his influence, the practice of true and undefiled religion, which is the great foundation of public prosperity and national happiness. They said it again. What's the key to happiness as a nation? And individually, privately, Christianity. But here they added another comment. What is the key to public prosperity? It, again, if you ask the average citizen, uh, how are we going to fix our economic woes? What's the solution to this? Well, you know what the answer is. <laughs> We've been seeing it in the news now for some time. In order to solve our massive economic problems, 
we assemble all of the, this, the, the most brilliant minds that we have. All of these economists have graduated from Ivy League schools. And the most recent, I suppose, solution was, well, we need to have a massive multi-trillion dollar spending package. We need to spend more money. And when that didn't work, well, we need to do it again. And you can go down the line. You could line up 50, 100 of the nation's top economists and go down the line. What do you think is the solution? How do you think we ought to solve the problem? What do you think are the keys to fixing our, our economic mess and bringing about national public prosperity? Folks, I dare say a single one of them would say what the founder said and what the Bible says. The founder said the key to all of our economic woes is for Americans to turn back to the laws of God, be obedient to God, promote and practice Christianity throughout our civilization, in all of our institutions, public and private. Now again, you may hear that and say, ah, hogwash, that's a bunch of bunk. And there are a number of people that say that. But I'm pointing out to you, the founder said it and believed it. And the Bible says it and believes it. In fact, I challenge you, I challenge you to go back to the Old Testament, to, for example, Deuteronomy chapter 28, where God was giving the Israelites the keys to national success as they were on the verge of entering into the Promised Land and occupying that piece of real estate as a national entity. There's a lot of direct connections between their circumstances and ours. Let me give you just one. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, God made very clear, when you go in to occupy this land, it'll come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all His commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. Is that what's happened to America? Have we not excelled all nations of the earth in human history? He said, the Lord will open to you His good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, to bless all the work of your hand. You'll lend, look at this, look carefully. You will lend to many nations. This is Deuteronomy 28, 12. You'll lend to many nations, but you won't have to borrow. You won't have to borrow. You're going to be prospering so well, you're going to be lending to others and helping them. But then as you move down further in that chapter, it will come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God and observe carefully all His commandments and statutes which I command you, you're going to have all kinds of curses come upon you and overtake you. The alien, for example, who is among you, he's going to rise higher and higher above you and you're going to go lower and lower. And then notice, haunting, these haunting words. He will lend to you, but you will not lend to him. Folks, we're just about there. We are just about there. America is in deeper debt than all of our history put together. We are in such deep debt that economists say that if our civilization were to continue, if our economy were not to collapse, it, it takes several generations just to pay it off. We are in such debt to foreign interests and even our, the average citizen is deep in debt with credit cards and so forth. Can we not see that this predicament heralds, it's, a, it's an indicator, it's a sign that we have deeper moral, spiritual problems. And we will either listen to the God of the universe and listen to the founders, or we won't. And if we don't, then we are doomed to suffer the consequences. This passage says, you disobey God as your citizens more and more in numbers turn away from God and Christianity. One of the indicators of that, you're going to go deep in debt. You're going to have to borrow from others. He's going to rise higher and higher. You're going to go lower and lower. We would do well to pay attention.
If you enjoyed America's Most Pressing Concern, you will want to read the book on which it was based, Christ and the Continental Congress, a beautiful coffee table style book that is filled with stunning pictures and powerful historical information about the founding. If you would like to have your own copies of the 15 Continental Congress proclamations, the proclamation packet is available that contains all 15 proclamations suitable for framing. You may also be interested in the prequel to America's Most Pressing Concern, The Silencing of God, available in both DVD and book formats. All of these items may be purchased at apologeticspress.org or by calling toll-free 800-234-8558.